So today we're going to be, well, this is not exactly a light topic, but we're diving into a really important part of the history of behavior analysis. It's uh, kind of unsettling, but it's something that I think we need to understand. We're talking about, you know, the Sunland Miami scandal. Right. It's one of those things like you really don't want to look at it, but you kind of have to in order to understand like where we are now and, and how far we've come. Right. Yeah. And and to set the scene for our listeners, imagine, if you will, back when behavior modification was was kind of like the Wild West. There was a lot of new stuff happening, a lot of experimentation, but not a whole lot of rules. And that's kind of where we're starting this whole deep dive. We're going back to the 1970s, to this institution in Florida for people with developmental disabilities. And we're going to use this book, Ethics for Behavior Analysts, to guide us through it and, and really see how this whole awful situation led to some, well, some pretty big changes in how we approach you know, behavior analysis today. Yeah, it's kind of amazing to think that something good could come out of something so bad. But but that's often how it happens. You know, a crisis can really force change. Definitely. Oh. So to really get into it, we need to we need to re rewind a bit further right. back to the 1960s. Behavior modification. It was still a pretty new idea back then. Oh, yeah. It was the new the hot new thing. Everyone was talking about it. Lots of potential, but but also a lot of risk. Yeah. I mean, they were still figuring things out. Right. Uh. And there really wasn't enough attention paid to how these techniques, you know, how they could actually hurt people if they weren't used carefully. And, and let's be real. The people on the receiving end of these treatments back then, they were they were incredibly vulnerable. Oh, absolutely. Many of them, they couldn't really speak up for themselves or say if something was wrong. Right. They were completely dependent on the very people who were supposed to be caring for them, which makes what happened at Sunland all the more disturbing. It, it really is. And, <laughs> and we're not just talking about, you know, a few bad apples here. What we're reading in Bailey this was this was systematic. This was abuse happening at every level, like forced public humiliation, physical punishments. They were even withholding basic needs like like food and water and trying to call it behavior modification. Yeah, it's just it's heartbreaking and infuriating. And, you know, what really gets me is they were keeping detailed logs of everything, almost like they thought what they were doing was like standard procedure. Yeah, it's. It's hard to wrap your head around how anyone could think those actions were okay. I mean, one resident was reportedly forced to sit in a bathtub for, for two days straight. I mean, come on. It's just, it's beyond any acceptable standard of care. And, you know, what's really messed up is that this was happening at a place that called itself a superb behavior modification program. Oh, the irony. Right. It's, it's sickening. And, sure. you know, another thing that's really unsettling is that this psychologist... They just call him Dr. E in the book. But he was in charge of this uh, this achievement division at Sunland. Right, Dr. E. And he was presenting himself as like a big shot expert, yeah. right? Yeah. But then when investigators started looking into him, contacting people he claimed to have worked with, most of them barely remembered him. It's a perfect example of how unregulated the field was back then. I mean, this guy with very questionable credentials has so much power over a group of very vulnerable people. It just makes you wonder if this was happening at Sunland, Miami, what might have been going on in other places that weren't under the same kind of scrutiny? I know, right? It's a chilling thought. It is. But, you know... As awful as it was, the Sunland Miami scandal really did force some much needed changes in the field. Let's let's talk about that. What happened after the news broke? Well, there was a huge public outcry, of course, mm. and a blue ribbon committee was formed to investigate. A blue ribbon committee? What is that? Basically, it means they gathered a bunch of experts to look into it. People who specialized in developmental disabilities, advocates for those with disabilities, and importantly, other behavior analysts. So they were serious about getting to the bottom of this. They were. And their report, let me tell you, they didn't hold back. They really exposed the failures that allowed this to happen. And they called for much stricter oversight, clear ethical guidelines, and a more professional approach to behavior analysis as a whole. I mean, they basically said this whole thing needs a complete overhaul, and they meant it. So this report comes out, and it's like, whoa, this is huge, right? But how do you even start to change how an entire field operates? Well, it was a massive undertaking, that's for sure. The report really hammered home the importance of having advocates involved, you know? Right, advocates. People who would actually go into these institutions, talk to the residents, see what was really going on. And make sure there were no more closed doors, no more secrets. Exactly. They knew it couldn't just be business as usual. Having those independent eyes watching, that was a big deal. Okay, so that makes sense. But... Just observing, it doesn't really change anything, right? Yeah. How do you go from watching 
to actually changing the way things are done. That's where the whole idea of peer review came in. Peer review, like colleagues checking each other's work. Exactly. Okay. The committee said, look, any behavior program, especially in places like Sunland, they need to be reviewed and approved by other experts in the field. No more just winging it. So like a system of checks and balances to make sure that the treatments were legit and not, you know. Barbaric. Yeah. And it wasn't just a rubber stamp either. The treatments had to be based on actual research, you know, proven methods, not just someone's pet theory or whatever they felt like trying. Accountability. That was the but big accountability, term. exactly. Did it actually work, though? Like, did people actually listen? You know, they really did. This report, it sent shockwaves. Organizations like the Florida Association for Retarded Children, they became huge advocates for change. So they saw this awful thing that happened, yeah. and they were like, we have to do better. Yes. They knew that behavior analysis could be a good thing, could really help people, but it needed these safeguards. It's actually kind of amazing. They saw past the horror of it all mm. and saw a chance to make things better. It's a testament to the power of advocacy, for sure. They helped turn this awful situation into a real turning point. And it wasn't just about punishing the people who did wrong at Sunland. Right. It was about preventing something like that from ever happening again anywhere. So what did that look like in reality? Well, the Division of Retardation, under this guy Charles Cox, they took those recommendations seriously. They created peer review committees all over the state, local and state levels, to really keep an eye on these programs. Okay, so this was real oversight with actual power to, to make a difference. Oh yeah, they weren't messing around. They could shut down programs that weren't cutting it, which got everyone's attention real quick. That's huge. It was a totally different world. Okay, but how do you make sure that everyone is on the same page when it comes to like what's ethical and what's not. Right, right. Are there like universal guidelines that came out of this? Well, that's where this group, the Statewide Peer Review Committee for Behavior Modification, they come in, the PRC. Okay. They came up with this whole set of guidelines for using behavioral techniques. And it wasn't just for Florida either. Really? Yeah, eventually the National Association for Retarded Citizens, they adopted them too. So it went national. National, exactly. That's how big this thing got. What started as this horrible situation in one place ended up changing things for the better all across the country. Wow. Suddenly, everyone was talking about the ethics of behavior modification. It really yeah. put the field under a microscope. And it wasn't just talk. This actually changed how behavior analysts were trained, how they were certified. Absolutely. Remember Dr. E, that whole thing with his iffy credential? Yeah. Yeah, that wouldn't fly anymore. The standards got a whole lot higher. So it was like, accountability everywhere from yeah. the people doing the work to the institutions themselves you got it the field was finally growing up it was a real coming of age moment and you know out of all of that something really amazing emerged the florida association for behavior analysis faba faba that's i mean every behavior analyst knows faba exactly so how did that happen well after everything that went down there was this real desire among practitioners in Florida, you know, to connect, to share knowledge. To make sure they were all on the same page. Yes. And most importantly, to keep that conversation about ethical practice going. So they had this big event in 1980, the first Florida work session on behavior analysis in retardation. Okay. It was huge. Everyone was there. Administrators, therapists, researchers. It's really something that this really positive thing came out of such a dark time. It is. And that was just the beginning. The next year, FABA was officially born. And get this, their very first conference, 1981, they had B.F. Skinner as the keynote speaker. B.F. Skinner, wow. That's like that's like having, I don't know, like the Michael Jordan of behavior analysis come and give your new organization a thumbs up. Exactly. It put FABA and really the whole field in Florida on the map. This was no. serious. It must have been amazing for the people who fought so hard for change to see that, you know, to see that kind of recognition. Oh, absolutely. And it didn't stop there. They kept pushing, kept raising the bar. FABA actually became the first state association to create its own code of ethics in 1988. Wow. So the code of ethics, the peer review, the focus on training, it all goes back to Sunland, Miami. It's mm -hmm. it's really kind of incredible, you know. Something so horrible could lead to such positive changes in the end. It really is. But we can't forget, you know, that this change it came at a cost. Those, what do they say, broken eggs? Those were real people, people who went through some awful, awful stuff. Yeah, no, that's that's a really important point. We can't we can't ever get complacent. We've got the guidelines now, the ethical codes. But I mean, 
they're just tools, right? Exactly. It's like having a scalpel doesn't make you a surgeon. Right. It's all about how you use them. Every behavior analyst, they need to be using these tools responsibly, ethically, and never, never losing sight of the fact that it's about the individual, about helping them. Yeah, it's not enough to just follow the rules because they're there. We have to be thinking about them, questioning if we're really doing the right thing. You know? Absolutely. And, and the thing is, this field, it's not static. It's always changing. New techniques, new challenges, and with those come new ethical questions. Right. What might have been okay decades ago might be totally unacceptable now. Exactly. And, and we can't fall into that trap of thinking we've got it all figured out. There's always more to learn, more to question, more ways to make sure we're doing the absolute best for the people we're serving. You said it. It's a journey, not a destination, you know? Totally. And and I think that's what makes this field so interesting, you know? Oh, absolutely. This whole Sunland Miami thing, it forced everyone to really look at the ethics in a real, real way. Mm. But just because we've made progress, it doesn't mean the conversation's over. It's never over. Right. We always have to keep asking ourselves those tough questions. So for everyone listening, here's something to think about. How can you make sure your actions at work, in your personal life, wherever, are guided by you know, compassion, respect, really wanting to do what's right. Because that's that's the real legacy of Sunland Miami. It's a reminder to be more thoughtful, more ethical, more dedicated to making sure everyone is treated with dignity. That's it, yeah. Never forgetting those who were hurt and honoring them by creating a better, more ethical future for everyone. Beautifully said. Well, that's about all the time we have for today's deep dive. Until next time. Thanks for listening, everybody.